you'll turn in your Bibles to James chapter 1. James chapter 1. James chapter 1, and we'll begin in verse 16. Do not err, my beloved brethren. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above, and cometh down from the Father of lights, with whom is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. Of his own will begat he us with the word of truth, that we should be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. Wherefore, my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath. For the wrath of man worketh not the righteousness of God. Wherefore, lay apart all filthiness and superfluity of naughtiness, and receive with meekness the engrafted word, which is able to save your souls. But be ye doers of the word, and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. For if any man be a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is likened to a man beholding his natural face in a glass, for he beholdeth himself and goeth his way and straightway forgetteth what manner of man he was. But whoso looketh into the perfect law of liberty and continueth therein, he being not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this man shall be blessed in his deed. In verse 17, James by inspiration informs us that all good and perfect gifts come from above. And it's important for us to see good, recognize good, seek good, look for good. And especially in times like these, right? The past year has been very difficult in many ways, uh, brought on by the, the COVID virus. And it has caused uh, difficulties beyond those normal difficulties that we were already going to face or, or face within our daily lives anyway. And so it's easy for us to, to get caught up in the things that are very difficult on us or to, to get caught up on the bad things that we see. Those things are related to us on news channels and uh, news uh, for formats uh, online over and over again. We're reminded of all the bad things that are going on. And sadly, many of the good things that some of these individuals report are actually bad. They cause us uh, sadness. They, they think they are good, but they're actually causing us sadness because they are against God's will. And we know that a righteous na a nation will prevail, but a nation that falls to sin and iniquity is one that is weak. And so it causes us heartache and pain. And uh, some of those things are out of our control, as we talked about in our morning Bible class. So it is important for us to remind ourselves that every good gift and every perfect gift is from above. And that we need to remind ourselves of what these good gifts are. We... Go back to the very beginning in Genesis chapter 1 to remind ourselves that God created things good. He created things for our good. He created things that had good purpose. Man has come along and abused those things and has done things with what God has created and, and perhaps turned them into evil. But if we remind ourselves that all these things came from God for our good, and if they are used for right purposes, they are good. In Genesis chapter 1, verses 1 through verse 3, In the beginning God created the heaven and the earth, and the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters, and God said, Let there be light, and there was light. And God saw the light that it was good, and God divided the light from the darkness. And God called the light day, and the darkness he called night, and the evening and the morning were the first day. We drop down to verse 10. And God called the dry land earth, and the gathering together of the waters he called the seas, and God saw that it was good. And God said, let the earth bring forth grass, the herb yielding seed, and the fruit tree yielding fruit after his kind, whose seed is in itself upon the earth, and it was so. 
And the earth brought forth grass and herb yielding seed after his kind, and the tree yielding fruit whose seed was in itself after his kind, and God saw that it was good. Drop down to verse 20. And God said, Let the waters bring forth abundantly the moving creature that hath life and fowl that may fly above the earth in the open firmament of heaven. And God created great whales and every living creature that moveth, which the waters brought forth abundantly after their kind, and every winged fowl after his kind. And God saw that it was good. When we look at the creation of the world and the earth and the universe and everything that in it, we see that God created it and God created it good. He saw that it was good. And we can look around the day at nature and we can see the good, the, the things that we can enjoy. Just the sunshine can uh, bring us a bit of happiness. In fact, uh, scientists say that the vitamin D that we receive from the sunshine can actually uh, increase our um, uh, happiness in a sense. It causes us to feel better, right? So maybe just sitting in the sun for a while, soaking in uh, some of God's nature. Obviously, getting fresh air is important. Being able to clear our minds of all the things that perhaps might be going on around us. And so just to sit in God's nature and to enjoy its beauty. We're very blessed in this area to have uh, lots of areas, parks, where we can sit on benches and look out over the lake and see the mountains and see the trees and see that what God made was good. It's no doubt, however, why individuals would become depressed uh, after they have uh, been told that all of the beauty that they see was an accident. No doubt that individuals would be depressed if they looked around and said that none of this was created for them. And that there was no purpose behind it. But when we look to Genesis chapter 1, we find that there was an almighty creator who loved man and wanted man to have all of this and created it for him and saw that it was good. And today, if we will remind ourselves that what God created was good. And of course, in the next chapter, or in the, in the um, next chapter, we find that uh, God made man. God made woman. And so we can see the good in God's creation. In Matthew chapter 5, in Jesus' Sermon on the Mount, Verse 43, Jesus says, Ye have heard that it hath been said, Thou shalt love thy neighbor and hate thine enemy. But I say unto you, Love your enemies, bless them that curse you, do good to them that hate you, and pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you. Obviously here, a, a verse that is worthy uh, and in need of a, a great deal of time of study, right? To appropriately uh, consider its value. But I think if we look at it just for our purposes this morning and understand that God is trying to get us to not focus always on the bad. People are going to do bad things to us. Even people that we once thought loved us <laughs> might do harm to us. And so as opposed to uh, trying to remain in thought on all those bad things, what are we told to do? Not to focus on those bad things, right? Seek to forgive if it's possible. But at the most, if it's not possible to forgive, and that is that if nobody repents and are not willing to ask for forgiveness, that we not uh, obsess over it. That we look for other things to spend our time on. And notice verse 45, he says, That you might be the children of your Father which is in heaven. For he maketh his Son to rise on the evil and on the good, and sendeth rain on the just and the unjust. You know, there are some people who would sit around and be angry when they see the sunshine because they know that there are wicked people in the world that are enjoying that sunshine. <laughs> As opposed to sitting there and thanking God for the blessing of the sunshine, they only can think of how this sun is benefiting evil people. And indeed it is. There are wicked people today enjoying everything God has made. And some of them spit in God's face and say he doesn't even exist. 
Well, that's sad and it can make us angry. But perhaps we could focus on the fact that God did make it and God made it because he loved us. And he does send his reign on the just and the unjust and he sends the son to pr produce good for the good and the evil alike. And whether those individuals who are wicked or despise God, hate God, deny God, whether they acknowledge that that good came from above, like James said it does, it doesn't matter. It still did come from above. They're enjoying the blessings of God. And there are evil and wicked people today in the world that enjoy the blessings that come from good, faithful people of God too. When we do good things, when we do what God tells us to do, it makes our society a better place. And wicked people enjoy that better society. And that's why it's important for us to remain engaged with our society, right? If, if faithful people of God make society better, then we ought to be as involved in society as we possibly can to make it as good as possible. Because we know if we don't get involved, if we're not uh, going to help society be better, we know what the alternative is. Individuals who are not interested in making the world a better place as it is defined by God. And so we need to focus on the fact that every good gift and every perfect gift come from, comes from above. But as we return back to our original text there in James 1, it's important, too, to remind ourselves not just of the physical goods. And sometimes we are able to uh, only consider gifts from a physical standpoint, right? <laughs> when we think of things that we have been given, it's easy for us to only think in terms of the physical world that we live in. But we need to remind ourselves of the spiritual gifts, which are far more important than the physical gifts. All of the things that God has provided, every good and perfect gift, comes from above, verse 17 of James chapter 1, and cometh down from the Father of lights, with whom is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. God has made promises. He's kept those promises. God has given us His Word. His Word still stands as truth today. He does not change from those things. Truth is truth today as truth was truth as we read it and it took place in Acts chapter 2. Truth is truth then, truth is truth now, and the truth will stand when Jesus returns. And on that day of judgment, we'll be held accountable to that truth. John 12 verse 48. The fact that God wants these good things to bless mankind is seen in the sacrifice of His Son. John 3.16 For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. That is a gift to mankind that not all people are accepting but a gift nonetheless. In 2 Corinthians chapter 9 2 Corinthians chapter 9. Paul writes, beginning in verse 11, being enriched in everything to all bountifulness, which causeth through us thanksgiving to God. For the administration of this service not only supplieth the want of the saints, but is abundant also by many thanksgivings unto God. While by the experiment of this ministration they glorify God for your professed subjection to the gospel of Christ and for your liberal distribution unto them and unto all men. And by their prayer for you which long after you for the exceeding grace of God in you. Once again, the just and the unjust, the good and the evil, all being blessed. Why? Because people are doing what God would have them to do. There are good, faithful people in the world who are enriching the world. They're doing the things that God would have them to do. They're teaching the gospel of Christ. They're professing subjection to the gospel of Christ. 
They are distributing unto those who are in need. Just an example of what good people would do to help others who are in need. They pray for one another, verse 14. And notice verse 15, he wraps it up by saying, Thanks be unto God for His unspeakable gift. <laughs> you know, we joke sometimes about the gift that keeps on giving. Right? And you can fill in the blank with whatever physical joke gift you might want to think of. But the gift that keeps on giving is God's love. When God started to give, everything that continued afterwards was a gift. His creation. His plan to save man. His Son. The Gospel itself that tells us how we can be in a right relationship with God. People doing what God say to do that helps others around them. In John chapter 6, verse 68, Jesus tells us that He has the words of eternal life. And in John chapter 1, the Bible tells us that He Himself was the Word in the beginning. And that He came and dwelt among us, God in the flesh. The Word in the flesh. He is the author of salvation unto all them that obey Him. Hebrews 5, 8 and 9. He is the perfect, complete gift. The sacrifice that made it possible for us to have hope. And so in Galatians chapter 2 verse 21, we are told that if Christ is that perfect sinless sacrifice, the, the greatest gift that man has ever seen, there is no need to go back to a law that can't save. And we discussed that just a few weeks ago when we looked at Galatians chapter 3. But we also don't need to go beyond the Word of God unto man's philosophies, right? Colossians chapter 2, verse 8. The wisdom of man. If that which is perfect is come, and it is, according to 1 Corinthians chapter 14, then we need to remain faithful to it, right? Jesus, the Word in the flesh, came and dwelt among us. And He has provided for us His perfect gift, the Bible, to keep us informed, to, to allow us to have the knowledge we need to be saved. In James chapter 1, verse uh, 21, Wherefore lay apart all filthiness and superfluity of naughtiness and receive with meekness the engrafted word which is able to save your souls. It is able to save your souls. Some people will not accept that gift. Why? Those who don't accept that gift are those, in verse 22, who might be hearers but not doers of the Word. And of course, there are some who don't receive that perfect gift from God, the Bible, His Word, in that they don't hear it. And if they don't hear it, they're obviously not going to do it either. And then in verse 25, it says, Whoso looketh into the perfect law of liberty. Once again, going back to a few weeks ago when we talked about the law of Moses in Galatians chapter 3 and how that law had been done away with and nailed to the cross. Colossians 2 verse 14. Making way for the perfect law of liberty. Another phrase to represent God's Word, the Word of God. The New Testament Christian faith. The system of faith by which we are saved today. And so when that which is perfect, that perfect law of liberty has come, we have that which is the greatest gift that we can hold on to today. And that is His Word. Jesus being the sacrifice, the perfect sacrifice, the great sacrifice, taking care of our sin problem, shedding the blood that was necessary in order for us to have remission of sins, living a perfect sinless life, and then giving us His Word. A good and perfect gift that is able to save our souls if we'll hear it, if we'll believe it, and if we'll do it. 
In 2 Peter chapter 1, Second Peter chapter one. Peter writes in verse nineteen, We have also a more sure word of prophecy, whereunto ye do well that ye take heed as unto a light that shineth in a dark place until the day dawn, and the day star arise in your hearts. Knowing this first, that no prophecy of the scripture is of any private interpretation. For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. When we open up the, the Bible, we have God's word. We have God's mind on the pages that we can read and we can understand and we can comprehend and we can learn from, and we can follow, and we can obey, and we can be saved by it. It's not open to interpretation, verse 20. The Apostle Peter says, this word of God uh, did not come by the will of man. In other words, uh, it's not from the opinions or mind of frail humans. Opinions that are equal to any other human's opinion, right? Where you can have your own opinions. The source, of the, will, the source of God's Word is the mind of God itself. And for that reason, it's not open to interpretation. It means what it says. And it says what it means. God, through His Holy Spirit, moved men, inspired men to write these words. It is a gift of God. It is good and it is profitable and it is perfect. God used men who are frail and who fall to write the Word of God. They were His pen, His pens. But the words they wrote were not frail. The words they wrote were not from man. They were God's words. They were God's ideas. And therefore it is a good and perfect gift that is from above. It is a good and perfect gift in many ways. Psalm 119 verse 105 tells us it is a lamp unto our feet to show us how to walk the road of life. In James chapter 1 verse 21 that we just read a moment ago, it is to serve its purpose to allow man to know what to do in order to be saved. To reveal the saving truth to mankind. In 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 22, obeying the truth is necessary to purify the soul. 1 Peter 1, uh, 1 Peter 1 verse 22, seeing ye have purified your souls in obeying the truth through the Spirit unto unfeigned love of the brethren, see that you love one another with a pure heart fervently, being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible by the word of God which liveth and abideth forever. God's good and perfect gift of his word is to offer an inheritance to all those individuals who would separate themselves from the world and be united to God in his word, Acts 20 verse 32. And in 2 Timothy chapter 3, Verse 16 and verse 17, all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. James said every good gift, every perfect gift is from above. Paul told Timothy, scripture, its purpose is that the man of God may be perfect, complete, in need of nothing, 
thoroughly furnished unto all good works, knowing everything he needs to do to accomplish this goal. And so Jesus the Christ, the great gift that shed the blood that was necessary for us to have our sins washed away. The Bible, God's good and perfect gift to show us the way, to show us how to walk, to show us how we can have our souls purified and how we can have that inheritance after this life. And then through Jesus' death and His Word, we have the establishment of the good and perfect gift we know as His kingdom, the church. The church is God's family on earth. It is a good and perfect gift. It is good and it is, per it is good because those who obey the truth are those who are saved. And those who are saved are added to the church. Notice Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2, verse 38. Peter and the apostles told the crowd, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins. In order to have your sins remitted or taken away. Verse 41, They that gladly received the word, God's good and perfect gift, from above, were baptized. And the same day there were added unto them about 3,000 souls, and they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and in breaking of bread and in prayers. And then verse 47, Praising God and having favor with all the people, the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. Who were they? Those who repented and were baptized. Uh, those who repented and were baptized, verse 38, those who continued daily in the apostles' doctrine. They were saved from their past sins because of the good and perfect gift that Jesus gave Himself on the cross, because of the good and perfect gift that these inspired men were able to preach that day, the gospel of Christ, the, the word that we have written in the Bible. And because of that good and perfect gift, where all those individuals who were obeying God were added to the church, Acts 2 verse 47. You know, throughout all of history, God has made a place for those who are being saved, right? We read of the ark being built in the day of Noah. We read of the tabernacle and the temple, the house of God throughout the Old Testament. And today, the church that Jesus built. Matthew chapter 16. In Matthew chapter 16. Verse 18. Jesus says, Thou art Peter, and upon this rock, and the rock is that previous confession that Peter had just made, that Jesus was the Christ, the Son of the living God. And, P and Jesus says, Upon that foundation I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And I will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. God's good and perfect gift, built by Jesus Himself. A place to hold the saved, Acts 2 verse 47. In Galatians chapter 3, Verse 26, Paul writes to the churches of Galatia, For you are all the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. That is, they had heard the word of God, they had believed it, and their faith was not a dead faith. Their faith led them to act in obedience and they were added to the body of Christ. They were now in Christ Jesus. And he explains that in verse 27, For as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither bond nor free, there is neither male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you be Christ's, then are you Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. In Christ we have salvation from our past sins. We have reconciliation with God. We have contacted the blood which Jesus shed. Acts 20 and 28. 
and we have become family members with the Christ. The church itself has divine attributes. Not only was it built by Jesus, but it was organized by God. Its worship defined by God. Its purpose, soul saving, bringing more people to God. And its responsibility, remaining faithful to the truth. Helping individuals stay saved once they have been uh, transformed or trans. Uh, laid it out of the darkness and into the light. As we consider all these good and perfect gifts that are from above, we note to ourselves that when individuals here in this physical world give a gift, it's usually, generally, given because someone loves you. It's usually generally given because someone has been thinking about you. It's usually generally given because somebody truly cares for you. God loved us. God gave His only begotten Son for us. God is full of grace and mercy. He is showered us with that grace and mercy and allowed us the, the time and the opportunity to contact that grace and mercy. All these things because God loved us. He shows His love and His concern for us with all of these good and perfect gifts. Those who receive gifts in this physical life usually reciprocate that concern and love to the one who gave, right? If we love God because He first loved us, we give of ourselves. Romans chapter 12, verse 1 and 2, we give ourselves a living sacrifice. We give of our time, Ephesians 5, 15 and 16, knowing that time is ticking. We give of our talents, our abilities, as we make application to the parable of the talents in Matthew chapter 25. We give back to God the things that He allows us to do. We give of our material goods, 1 Corinthians 16, 1 through verse 2, right? We give of our means every first day of the week. These are things that people who appreciate good and perfect gifts do for the one who gives the good and perfect gift. How shameful it is to think that individuals want the benefit of every good and perfect gift that comes from above, but then don't reciprocate the love and the concern to the giver. Because of God's love and because of the perfect gift and the good gift that comes from above, we should give back in return the things that we can. Not because we owe God anything, but because that's what people who love do. And so, we see the grace of God and the mercy of God when we extend the invitation. This invitation only exists because God loved and because Jesus loved and because Jesus gave Himself on the cross, shedding the blood that was necessary to wash away sins. We have the opportunity to read and study and hear the good and perfect gift, the Bible, to know how to obtain God's grace and mercy. Appropriate that, God, that good gift of grace and mercy. When we hear and we believe and we act upon those things, confess that Jesus is the Christ, just like Peter did. Confess that uh, repent of our past sins just like we were all those on the uh, first Pentecost after Jesus' death and burial and resurrection did in Acts chapter 2, repenting of their sins and being immersed so that we can be added to the church. Those are all responses that are reasonable and logical based on the good and perfect gift that God has supplied. And as a result, we become God's children. Galatians chapter 3. We're added to the body of Christ. Acts 2 verse 47. 
we're saved from our past sins. And we have the hope of eternal life. And so from that point on, we live a life of faithfulness. If you've not yet obeyed the invitation, it's extended. If you have any other need in your life that we can help you with, we extend that helping hand as well as we stand and sing.